Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Easter worship at the well. I am Pastor Ed and I am honored to be with you. I see a lot of new faces. I hope that you feel welcome. The well is a welcoming community that welcomes all people, regardless of their background, their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, their economic activity, anything. All people are welcome here. All religions, people who have doubts, people who have disbelief, you are welcome here. And this is a great place to be. I love this congregation, and I hope that you can feel the love that is here. So many good things are happening at the well. I'm not going to go through all the announcements, Brian. I should have given you a heads up on that. But I can tell you that every week we have great activities, great groups that meet, choirs, pickleball if you're into pickleball, um, groups that talk about important issues, and it's a very active congregation that I'm very proud to be a part of, but I don't want to do all those announcements today. We do have an egg hunt today for the adults. <laughs> I'm serious, the kids are going to have to watch, but <laughs> we got the egg hunts for the adults, it's going to be fun. Um, you can watch... Adults run around and fight over eggs. It's just going to be great. So that'll be after the service if I don't preach too long. So we'll have a, a motive there to stop early. <laughs> Those are all of my announcements, our special music.
Please rise as you are able for our call to worship. At early dawn they came, expecting death, but instead they experienced new life, resurrection. At early dawn, the mystery of hope is reborn, death denied. Love eternal rises in our hearts. We have kept vigil with Jesus from, from death, death into, into new life. life. So now we celebrate the good news. Life, life is stronger than death. than death. Christ has risen. He, he has risen, risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our first hymn. I sing really well. <laughs> you may be seated. It didn't make the bulletin, but we have an amazing bell choir this morning. We are so happy to have them here.
Come on up, kids. We've got a lot of visiting kids today. You may not know me, but we'll have some fun. Come on up, and normally I have you sit on the step, but today I want you to sit on the floor so you're facing me this way. We're doing a little bit different today. Oh, come on up, kids. It's fun. Don't worry about it. You can bring your mom or dad if you want. It's okay. Come on up. Here we go. I want to know how many of you got one of these today? You got an Easter basket? Yeah. Who else got an Easter basket today? What was in your basket? Peeps. Peeps. Okay. What else? Candy. What was in your basket? Marshmallows. Marshmallows. Oh, socks. socks. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a good Easter sock. <laughs> and we do that on Easter. Isn't that kind of fun tradition? I like that. But I wanted to go through these things and tell you what they have to do with Easter, okay? How about these little marshmallow peeps? Who got one of these? Yum, Yum yeah. Guess what it has to do with Easter? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but what if you put a duck in chocolate? Yummy. Yummy. You know what it has to do with Easter? Nothing. <laughs> You're catching on. Reese's peanut butter cups. No, Nothing. What if you put peeps on a stick? No oh. butter roll. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> what if you had a dark chocolate Easter bunny? Oh. Yeah. The answer is nothing, but I'm not going to throw that one. <laughs> How many got one of these? You get some eggs? Now we're getting somewhere. Eggs are signs of new life, right? Yeah. And we have a tradition that the Easter bunny brings eggs. And I promised the congregation, and I'll tell you now, we're going to talk about that during the sermon, so you can stay awake for that part, okay? Why does a bunny bring eggs? We'll get back to that. So eggs are about new life, right? You know what I don't like about hard-boiled eggs? What? Peeling them. You know, you have to work and work and get all those shells off. Sometimes I even take a bite of shell. No good. I'm going to show you a trick. You'll never have to peel an egg again, okay? Makes it really easy. You just do this and tap it on your forehead, okay? Just like that. Think you could do that? I'll, I'll demonstrate. That doesn't normally happen. <laughs> this one will work. <laughs> Try again. No. <laughs> I made a mess. <laughs> they weren't hard boiled. I'll tell you what Easter's about, and we have these fun traditions with eggs and chocolate and bunnies and all this fun stuff. Easter is about something really important, that God tells us life is stronger than death. Death is inevitable. Everybody passes away at some point, but God promises and guarantees us there is life beyond this world, and I take great comfort in that, and I rejoice in that. So a quick prayer, and I'll send you back to your seats. Lord God, bless these young children here. Help them to have a great Easter. Bless this time in worship today. Let it be filled with your spirit. Keep watch over these children, Lord. Protect them and keep them safe at all times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may go back to your seats. Unless you want some raw egg, you're welcome. To... <laughs> I didn't think about how we're going to clean this up. Okay. <laughs> Our opening prayer. A blessed Easter morning to you. My name is Lisa Ellis, and I'm honored to bring you the opening prayer. Please join me. Gracious and all-powerful God, on this glorious Easter Sunday, we rejoice in the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Just as the women encountered the empty tomb and the angelic message of new life, 
we too encounter the living Christ in our hearts and lives. As we come to present our tithes and offerings, may they, may they be an affirmation of our search for the risen Christ, the one who challenges us to see beyond our own expectations. We have glimpsed the empty tomb and been touched by the mystery. So we cannot be silenced. We cannot keep this gift to ourselves. Come God, draw us in to meet the risen Jesus and help us find our voices to share the astonishing news. Holy Lord Jesus, on this day we rejoice in your glory and stand in awe of how you have transformed this world with your dying and your rising. Receive our joyful praise. Alleluia. Amen. God, we offer to you what you first gave to us. We offer ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Amen. You may be seated. It's such a blessing to come together in this beautiful space, gathering with friends and family, gathering with other people here to worship, and to pray for God's blessings. I pray that you're blessed during this time. I pray that the Holy Spirit just kind of pours out on top of you like a raw egg everywhere. <laughs> I want you to go forth today knowing that God is with you, knowing how much you were loved, and that the good news is the best news. So be with me this morning in a spirit of prayer.
Lord God, you've blessed us in so many ways. We give thanks today for this chance to be in worship, and we pray for your church, your church here and around the world. Churches everywhere celebrating Easter today. May people worship safely in the celebration. May people hear the good news that life is stronger than death, that Jesus has risen, and we can rejoice. Lord, in your mercy. And yet, Lord, we live in a very troubled world, a world that's filled with hatred and violence, terrorism, terrible things, famine, earthquakes, floods. We know there's war in the world. Today we pray for the people of Palestine and Israel, Ukraine and Russia, Yemen and Haiti, and all places where there's fighting, Lord, bring peace. Lord, in your mercy. We have a tradition of me coming around with the microphone. If you have a prayer request this morning, raise your hand. We're happy to share it. You're just being shy. <laughs> I'm very grateful to see the congregation full and to hear all the wonderful voices uh, from everyone. So thank you, everyone. And it's so good to see uh, some young people that we knew as babies that have grown up and are teenagers and even beyond return yeah. to, to their home church. God bless it you all. It is a true blessing to have so many people here and so many young people. We do a different one prayer for this. I say, in the, all, and the people of God say... Thanks be to God. There we go. You guys figured that out. <laughs> I'll lift up a prayer of thanksgiving that I bet a lot of you can echo. My life is blessed. I'm one of the lucky ones. I have two beautiful daughters who are strong and independent, sometimes to a fault. <laughs> and I have four grandchildren. I waited years for that. And it's a blessing. I know not everybody's that blessed. But if you were loved, if you have people around you, friends, family, whoever, Embrace them, enjoy them, and give thanks for them. And the people of God say, Thanks be to God. We join now in the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray at all occasions, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able. Hymn 308.
Amen. You may be seated. The Holy Scriptures today, from the 16th chapter of the book of Mark, represent an ending for this congregation. We have gone through almost the entire gospel in the last two or three months. It's the earliest gospel. It's not my favorite, but I've really become to appreciate it. I find things now I've missed before, and I've read them many, many times. And today, when we get to the story of the resurrection, I really thought that Mark had got it wrong, that he goofed up. I'm not the only one that thought that, and I'll show you in just a minute. But from the 16th chapter of the book of Mark, listen and hear the word of the Lord. Let's start with this. When the Sabbath was over, what day of the week is Sabbath for the Jews? Saturday. It starts Friday at sundown. So Jesus was crucified in the afternoon, died, and was quickly buried because there wasn't time to do a proper burial because Sabbath was coming. When that sun goes down and Sabbath begins and you cannot work. Sabbath ends Saturday night when the sun goes down. So then they could take care of Jesus, but it's dark. He's in a cemetery. Who wants to do that? So they go as soon as they can, first thing Sunday morning, and we get the Easter story. And by the way, that's why we worship on Sundays today, because they couldn't get there on a Saturday. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb And they were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. They didn't really have a plan, did they? What if it had been there? How would they have done this? Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. Of course they were. They're expecting Jesus. They're here to anoint his body. The tomb has been opened, and here's a person inside they don't know. What are they going to think? What have you done? What's happened to Jesus? But he said to them, don't be alarmed. Or in some translations, I love this, fear not. Now, we're going to decide later he's an angel. Mark doesn't say that. He describes them in very human terms for a reason, I think. And I just want to comment about angels. Almost every single time they appear in the Bible, they say the same darn thing when they show up. Don't be afraid. Because <laughs> I just had this feeling if an angel suddenly you know, was in your house, you don't go, <laughs> I would. <laughs> don't be afraid. Fear not. Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter. Now, that one really bothers me. There are the disciples. We know about the disciples. There's 12 of them, and Peter's always like the the lead guy. Go and tell the disciples, especially Peter, in some translations, and Peter, and another translation, even Peter, (laughs) including Peter. This word is kind of weird. Peter's singled out. Why? Remember the events when Jesus is arrested? I'll never forsake you, Lord. He follows Jesus along to where he's being tried, and people recognize him. You're one of those Jesus guys. I can tell by your accent you're Galilean. Peter says, you're wrong. I don't know that man. Happens three times. There's a cock crows each time, or cock crows at the end, or something related to a a rooster, we're not really sure. But Peter has really done the thing he said he wouldn't do. I will never deny you. I will always be with you. And here he's denied him. And come Sunday morning, go tell the disciples, even Peter, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. 
Okay. So Jesus isn't there. He is in Matthew, Luke, and John. Oh, he's in Matthew and Luke. But he's not here in this story. And it's like, oh, that's weird. I want him there. I want to see Jesus. I want to know what he's like. I want to know what he has to say. But he's not there. And this man says, go ahead to Galilee, the northern part of Israel, back to where Jesus lived, back to where you're all from, back to where you used to fish. Go, go to Galilee and you'll see him. Now, the first people to ever hear the good news of Jesus Christ weren't men, they were women. And in the other Gospels, the first people to ever spread the good news of the resurrection were not men, but women. Women were much closer to the disciples than people give them credit for. But this Gospel takes a slightly different bend on this. There's only one more verse. You will see him there just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That is the end of the gospel. Now, if you open your Bibles and look, there's 12 more verses. But people who can read first century Greek and people who are smarter than I am tell us those 12 verses are written in a different style of Greek at a different time by somebody who was copying this manuscript and said, no, we can't stop there. <laughs> Mark got it wrong. <laughs> we got to add this other stuff, and they add it, and it's in your Bible, and you can look at that. But Mark's original gospel stops here. They were afraid, and they went out, and they didn't tell anybody. Well, obviously, they're going to at some point, right? All right. Grace to you and peace from God, who is our Father, and our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Blessed Easter to you. You remember your refrain, Christ is risen? He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, starting from this text. And I like it a lot more than I used to. I'm realizing that Mark is telling a story here, and... He's taken us all the way from Jesus' baptism to the miracles and the teachings and the, all the trials and errors and things that have happened to this point and kind of left us there. And I sort of relate to that. I've gotten to this point. I'm here on Easter morning and I'm celebrating and I want to believe, but a part of me is afraid and a part of me thinks, can this be true? Christians have wrestled with this message for thousands of years. If you're here today because your family brought you and you didn't want to come, raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't have to do that. It happens. It happens. If you're here today and you think, oh, Christians, they believe all that gobbledygook. I can never believe that. I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I, I reject all that doctrine. I don't believe all those things. Guess what? I don't either. I believe some of them. I don't believe all of them. We could go through that list sometimes. That'd be interesting. It's not about what you believe. It's about how your life has been touched. It's not about believing the right things. It's about loving the right way. Every single time, Jesus gets the chance. And people say, what's the most important thing? He comes back the same time, every time. He never says, you got to believe in the resurrection. You got to believe in the virgin birth. You got to believe water to wine or walking on water, whatever it is. He never says that. What's the most important thing you could do? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. What's the second most important thing you could do? Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no belief. There's no doctrine. There's no dogma. There's no nothing there but love. That's the message of Easter and Christianity. But it gets buried. That happens. I like to go through the history of this. And my congregation can tell you I get a little carried away sometimes with the archaeology. We first looked at the Jordan River around Jesus' baptism and talked about where he might have been baptized, where John the Baptist might have been preaching. People still go to the area today to be baptized. It's beautiful. We went to Capernaum, which is a village that was destroyed, luckily, about 1,800 years ago and never rebuilt. Why do I say luckily? Because a lot of the first century buildings are still there. We can see the synagogue where Jesus preached, the foundation of it anyway. We can see a home 
mostly destroyed now, but still in part, where we think Peter lived. And Jesus lived in Capernaum, so we're in his town. And then about 20 years ago, they found a fishing boat that, guess what, is about 2,000 years old. They call it the Jesus boat. They dug the thing up, and it's in pretty good shape. And now we can tell what kind of fishing boats they had, how big it was. I find that fascinating. We talked about Jesus' teachings and his miracles. And we, I went down a rabbit hole one time about the Roman legions, the 12th legion, and the evidence that the 12th legion was there, and all the evidence, and... and I won't go down that again. We saw Pontius Pilate's name written in stone. I got to come back to that. Pontius Pilate. We all talk about, everyone knows who Pontius Pilate is. He's one that condemned Jesus to die. People tell me this story didn't happen. People tell me this whole thing's made up. There's so many reasons that's not true. I won't go into all of them. But here we've got a 2,000-year-old stone with Pontius Pilate's name on it. In Caesarea, right where they thought he lived. I just... I just love that kind of stuff. So when you go to Jerusalem today, the holiest places you can see are Bethlehem, of course, and where Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. Now, we have a great history on this, going back to Constantine the Great. He was a Roman emperor in the early 300s. He's known and is famous because he was baptized before he died. When the head of the Roman army, when the head of the Roman government, when the most powerful world person in the world is baptized, guess what the rest of the country does? <laughs> they follow along. It becomes the national religion. And his mom was this wonderful woman named Helena, and she said, I want to go to see where Jesus lived. So when the mother of the most important person in the world wants to go, of course, she goes. And she gets the best guides. And she gets to Israel and she goes, I want to see everything. Show me where he was born. Now, this is about the year 330. 330 years later, she wants to know where was he born. Can you show me the spot? Should you say no, you don't know where it is? <laughs> you say, of course I'll show you. It was right here. <laughs> she said, that's amazing. Build a church. There's a church in Bethlehem, 1,700 years old, thanks to her. I get into that, we'll be here all day. I want to see where he preached on the Mount of Olives. I want to see, uh, she went to Mount Sinai in, in the Sinai Desert. She wanted to see all these biblical places, but most of all, she wanted to see where he died and where he was buried and where he was resurrected. And they did not disappoint. They took her a spot in Jerusalem and said, this is where he died, this is where he was buried, this is where he was resurrected. And there was a Roman temple had been built at that spot. She ordered that temple torn down and a church built. Now here comes the fun. 1,700 years ago, they start digging around in the dirt and guess what they find, if you believe the story, three crosses. Well, there were three crosses in the story. This is getting good, isn't it? But which one is the true cross? Which one was Jesus' cross? Well, they bring in a blind person who touches the first two crosses and nothing happens and touches the third and they're healed. Now, this is all 1,700 years old. I don't expect you to believe all this, but it's a great story. <laughs> and she goes, that's the true cross. And she takes it back to Rome. And there's so many pieces of the true cross in the world today, you could build several fleets with it. <laughs> Martin Luther was big on that. He goes, there's so many pieces of the cross, you could make a boat out of it. And he says, there were 12 disciples. And he said, 14 of them were buried in Germany alone. <laughs> You want to see where John the Baptist's head is? It's in three spots. <laughs> Over the centuries, this stuff gets all mixed up, doesn't it? I've got pictures here of the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, what it looks like today. Not a beautiful building. Not a, it's historic, but not great. And next. Now, inside and under the dome is this substructure, which is an altar or a some sort of structure around the place where Jesus was laid when he died. And you can go in there and you can see it and it's gaudy. Uh, lots of candles, lots of incense, lots of gold and velvet and stuff. Not my style. What's next? This is where Jesus died. 
and they built an altar there. Not my style. I'm not trying to criticize them. Some people love this. Some people go by this. I like this style better. I like the minimalist. But here you go. This is where Helena was told, this is where Jesus died. Build a church. Put an altar there. Okay, what's next? There's the actual spot he died. They put the cross up. Okay. So you can see that. And next. This is interesting. Holy Week. Um, this is Ethiopian custom. They gather around the structure under the dome and they light candles. It's beautiful, isn't it? I want to be there for that, but I'm guessing it's hard to get tickets. And next. <laughs> okay. Here's the pettiness of Christianity at work. I know you'll be shocked, but some Christians are petty. <laughs> In the 1700s, a group of workers were on this building doing whatever they were doing, and they quit for the day, and they forgot their ladder. You can see it. And somebody went to take it down, and a whole bunch of people jumped up and said, you can't do that. Why can't I take the ladder down? They forgot it here. You don't have the authority to remove that ladder. Yes, we do. No, you don't. They're arguing about it 300 years later. <laughs> the ladder's still there. The Pope has chimed in on this. He's made a proclamation that nobody can move it until they agree on who can move it, and it's still there, and you can see it. It's a testament to the pettiness of Christians, and I just had to put it up there for fun. <laughs> Christ has risen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, if you don't like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's not your style, there's another choice. In the 1800s, there was an archaeologist, I have to look at the name here, who said, you know, he was in his hotel and he looked out the window and there was this hill. And he said, that hilltop kind of looks like a skull. And that's relevant because Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And as he squinted and looked at it, he goes, that kind of looks like a skull to me. Maybe that's Golgotha. There's a picture of this one, the rough drawing. You can kind of see the skull face there, sort of. It's worse today because there's been a lot of erosion. But it was enough to prompt some other archaeologists to dig there, and they found a tomb at the base. Next. This is called the Garden Tomb. Many, many people think this is where Jesus was buried. And it does fit some of the physical description we get from the scriptures. I don't know if it's the right one or not. But it's a tomb that turns to the right. It's a tomb in approximately the right location. It's near a Golgotha. There's a trough there for a really large stone like the women were worried about. And inside, what do I have here for slides? There's a sample of a stone. They've never found a stone for that, but this is a type of stone that would have been there. And if this is the place where Jesus was buried, this is probably the spot where he was crucified. I got a kick out of this. I used to take the buses there when I was in Israel. He was crucified at the bus station. I, a part of me thinks that's right. It's every day. It's not sacred. It's not holy. It's not somehow special with candles and gold and incense. It's just, it's just every day. This is where he died. Do I have any more of this? I can't remember what I put in here. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, thank you to Brian. Um, I've agreed to send him my pictures by Friday night, and I forgot some of them this week, and he put them in this morning. So God bless you, Brian. I appreciate that. So we don't know where Jesus was crucified. We don't know where he was buried. We don't know where he was resurrected, and it doesn't matter. I find it interesting historically I think it's fascinating. You can go to Bethlehem and see the spot where he was born. And I go, I doubt it. But guess what? For 1,700 years, Christians have come to that spot and prayed. And for 1,700 years, people of faith have worshipped there. And 1,700 years of faithfulness and worship to me is sacred and special, regardless of the history. So I get a lot excited by that. The other thing I like to talk about is art and Christian representations. And thank you, Brian. I put these in at the last minute. Let's skip ahead a little bit to which one's next. This is a crucifixion picture, obviously, and I had to put it in because it shows us a couple of things. The way people depict Jesus on the cross tells you a lot about who they think he is. 
if you look at that man, he's strong. Is he suffering? No, he's almost a perfect T-shape. He's not upset. This is what was supposed to happen, right? The next slide shows you at the foot of the cross is a skull. When you go to the Minneapolis Institute of Art, you look at these old paintings of the crucifixion, look for the skull. It's almost always there. The Christian tradition was that Jesus was crucified on Golgotha where Adam and Eve had lived, and that's Adam's skull. And when Jesus' blood drips on it, it erases original sin. <laughs> that's a lot to put in one skull in one painting, but there it is. What's our next one? Oh, I'm little, this is good. Here's another athletic, strong Jesus being resurrected out of a sarcophagus that is probably from the 1400s, certainly not a tomb. This is the famous painting because Jesus isn't suffering. Jesus isn't upset. He's in control. He's got his foot in that sarcophagus like I own this thing. Got the flag there. The guards are completely wiped out at the bottom. Sleeping, phase, I don't know what. Look in the background. There are trees on the left that are old and are not flowering not leaves, because the artist is telling us the old ways have passed away. As soon as we had the resurrection, everything changed. Look to the right, you see new life, new growth in the trees. That's the sign of the resurrection, new life. Okay. This is maybe my favorite piece of Christian art by Matthias Grunwald, and it's from the, I think, the 1500s. And what you see there is a triptych. It has doors that close on it so they can cart it around. But it's a big piece. Is that Jesus suffering? Yeah. That Jesus is in pain. If you can see closely, and you can see better in the back monitor, he's covered in sores, scores all around his skin. It's like he's a leper or something. The artist that painted this painted it for a hospital for lepers. And he painted Jesus with leprosy. I love that theology. He's one of us. There he is on the cross, and he's suffering. You have saints around the side. And um, I do a class on how to recognize saints in literature. If the guy's pointing or holds a lamb, it's John the Baptist. If a woman has a flask, and see that woman to the left there with the flask? That's Mary Magdalene. That's the oils. And the other people we have there, Mary and then John, not as easy to identify, but those are the people. My favorite paintings are, are fun. Then they'll have a couple of people that aren't in the Bible, and they'll like, these two people are just standing there. Who are they? And it's fun to find out they're the people that paid for the painting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put any of those pictures in. I, I just love that image. Now, this is interesting. The next one's... This is the resurrection of Jesus. You got the sarcophagus, you got the guards at the bottom, but this Jesus isn't standing on the tomb like an athletic hero. He's more spiritual. He's floating up in the air. He's parting with the sun. He's got this red around him, looks like a flame. Hard to imagine, hard to picture. And I found out this morning when I was doing our research on this that's the same artist that painted the Jesus on the cross with the leprosy. That's why I had to bring these other pictures in, which is the next. Oh, go back to the, to the one with the um, odd shape. There we go. That structure, that triptych of Jesus on the cross, when you close it, looks like this. And look to the right there. That same artist that showed Jesus in such a terrible state, that's his picture of the resurrection. Transformed from death to life. I get excited by that. Okay, I'll stop soon. The, the reason I didn't like this gospel originally, how can we end with the women afraid and leaving? It makes more sense to me now. Who's there? All through Mark's gospel, he talks about the big crowds around Jesus. There's no crowds. All through Mark's gospel, they're in the shadow of the Romans. There's no Romans there. All through the gospel, he's surrounded by the disciples. There are no disciples there. 
All around the gospel, there's women who cared for him and the disciples, and there's three of them there, and they run away. Who's left? You and me. That's who Mark's writing this to. You're the last witness. You're the last one there. What are you going to do now? You're going to go to Galilee? You're going to make this a part of your life? You're going to try and understand what's happened here today? Or are you going to run away too? It's the perfect ending. Christ is risen. Christ is risen Alleluia and amen. You may, may rise for our hymn. are God's Easter people. Hallelujah. May the grace of the risen Christ, the love of God, and the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit bless us so we can be a blessing to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.